Yes. Yes. Where, oh, we can yes. start now. It's yes. 331. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Srini. Yes. We'll go ahead and start. Good afternoon, everyone. And if you're on the other part of the world, good morning. So I'd like to just uh, go ahead and start this seminar series. So Ben, if you move to the second slide. We are still on the first. It's the second one. It's just been slow progressing with issues, I think. Okay, introduction. Sure. So, Ivan is right now assistant professor at uh, University of Purdue in the School of Mechanical Engineering. Uh, before that, Ivan was a Feynman Distinguished Postdoctoral Fellow at Los Alamos. And before that, he was a NSF Mathematical Science Postdoctoral Fellow at uh, Princeton. And Ivan did his uh, PhD from Northwestern in 2011. He has been doing a lot of work in the area of uh, transport theory at Lower and Alls number. And with that, Ivan, it's all yours. Great, thank you. Can you see my screen appropriately? Yes, I'll go okay, ahead and so mute please. myself and video, it's all yours, Ivan. Okay, great. Well, thank you everybody for, for coming to this webinar. I know it's a new experience here in 2020, uh, but also there's some opportunities. I, I'm sure there's people in this webinar who maybe I would not have interacted with otherwise if it was just a, a regular seminar in a conference room at a specific university. So uh, let me begin just by saying a few words about what I do. And of course, Devesh already introduced my background. Uh, but more generally, I would like to point out that my work is fundamentally in fluid mechanics, but it also intersects soft matter physics. And my background is actually in applied mathematics. So I'd like to, to say that I'm an applied mathematician working in continuum mechanics. The mission statement for my research group is, is down here at the bottom. Uh, you can read it yourself, but I would like to point out that our main purpose, our main goal in my research group is to make progress on fundamental basic science research questions at the interface of engineering, mathematics, and physics. And, and this struck me as interesting because I was reading the announcement for the seminar and I saw Professor Srinivasan's uh, own uh, little background blurb. And he also mentions that his work is at the interface of engineering, mathematics, and physics. And so I was very pleased to see that. Uh, you know, of course, I, I did not make this, this, this Venn diagram for this particular talk. It's actually a Venn diagram I've used many times. And so it was very nice that there's an interesting sort of coincidence here that the, uh, the uh, moderator's biographies also, uh, at, you know, he works at the same interface. So that's the big picture. Uh, what I'd like to get into though is two specific problems at low Reynolds number uh, that I think might be interesting to you. So the first one would involve discussing how we come up with predictive rigorous mathematical theories of the flow use deformation of, of three-dimensional line channels. With, uh, a little bit of background noise. Maybe people can mute themselves as they come in. Uh, so that's the first problem I'd like to discuss. And the second one would also be at low Reynolds number, but it would involve uh, fluid fluid interfaces, specifically how we manipulate them via external forcings. In the example I'll show you, it will be a ferrofluid droplet interface manipulated by magnetic fields. Okay, let's start with the first problem. So what do you think of when you hear hydraulics? So I teach at Purdue undergraduate fluid mechanics. Hydraulics is a huge topic in that course. Uh, you, and my students in that class, and maybe many of you think of the picture that you see on the left, an industrial pipe network. This is a hyd hydraulic system. The channels are large, perhaps meters in diameters even. The flows are very high speed. They're probably turbulent. And the materials are hard. These are things made out of steel, for example. These pipes are supposed to withstand large pressures. Uh, but what I'd like to discuss with you is not that kind of hydraulics, a different kind of hydraulics that occurs at the micro scale. So on the right, you see uh, an example, uh, an example microfluidic chip. In this case, I think it's one used for chemical analysis made by Darwin Microfluidics. And so this also has channels. You can see them. They're, they're visualized by having some dyes in them, blue and red. There's some entry ports and some outlet ports. It is a hydraulics problem, but it's very different. These channels are now hundreds of microns across. So that's the diameter of the human hair. The flows are laminar. 
viscosity that dominates in these regimes. And the materials that these microchips are made from are actually soft. They're typically gel-like materials like, like PDMS. So that's one easy one. Easy, that's, that's one convenient material from which you can manufacture this, this micro fluidic chips with ease. And so what can happen then is that because these this materials are soft, then these channels can deform. This is what we call flow-induced deformation of the compliant microchannel. And many different groups have actually analyzed this experimentally with, with various degrees of fidelity in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. I'm going to highlight two nice pictures. One is on the left from, from a Klaus Janssen's group at MIT, and the other one is from a Camille Kinch's group at Boston University on the right. Uh, they're both highlighting the same thing. You have a microchannel. It has an initially rectangular cross-section. It is shallow and wide. You can see that. And as you drive a flow through it, uh, and you can see on the left, uh, the flow direction is highlighted, uh, the channel deforms. So there's large deformation near the inlet, smaller deformation near the outlet. Uh, that's because the pressure decreases as you go down the channel, uh, as you would in a regular channel. And so the, the, the fundamental question is, how do we understand the hydraulics in such a compliant system? If this was a rigid system, we know how to relate the flow rate at steady state to the pressure drop that you impose through some hydraulic resistance. If you write it this way, it's the inverse hydraulic resistance. Uh, this is what we call Poiset's law, very commonly. And it's important, right? You would like to know how much stuff you can drive through given the applied forces, the pressure drop. And we know that for rigid systems and we use it and we solve lots of engineering problems. Now, the question is what happens in the, in the case of the soft hydraulic system? Somehow, the pressure induces the deformation, right? These are the hydrodynamic forces, normal forces pushing on the walls of the channel. They're causing a deformation. So we need to relate the flow to the, sorry, the pressure to the deformation and then use that information to eventually relate the pressure to the flow. And this extra complication is what I call the soft hydraulics problem. There's two steps now. Pressure causes deformation and then that induces a different kind of pressure flow relationship. And uh, this gets us into FSI, fluid structure interaction. Okay, so there's a number of different uh, uh, situations one, one has to consider, and you have to do this carefully, because when you get elasticity involved into the problem, it really matters what kind of geometry you are solving the problem in, right? The equations of elasticity are very different for infinite half spaces versus shells versus plates versus two-dimensional versus axisymmetric. There is a tremendous number of details now that are very important. Traditionally, people like to think of this as a one-dimensional problem, uh, so those are cases such as the planar vertical deformation, case A, uh, three-dimensional axisymmetric, which is case B or C in my pictures here on the right that you see. All these problems are, are one-dimensional because uh, the deformation has no cross-sectional dependence. So at any given Z location, that's the location in the flow-wise direction downstream, you can have a local deformation, U of Z, which can be in the vertical direction for the 2D case, in the radial direction for the axisymmetric cases. And it's entirely given to you by the pressure of that location. So those, those are problems people like to analyze traditionally because they're quite, uh, they're quite convenient. Oops. They're quite convenient. There's a linear relationship, at least according to linear elasticity, between the local deformation of the cross-section and the local pressure. And that's all you need to know. There's some proportionality constants. They depend, of course, on the thickness of the elastic material. They depend on this modulus of elasticity, which could be E, G, lambda, whichever modulus you would like to use. And it can depend on the radius of the channel A. So those are nice cases that can be analyzed very easily. What I really want to talk to you about today, though, is the really challenging case in panel D, the three-dimensional rectangular microchannel. Uh, it is challenging because now you have to account for the cross-sectional variation of deformation. So at, at different X locations, that's across the channel now, you can have different deformations, obviously. If you, if you imagine that microchannel looks like my cartoon on the bottom right, it is a thin elastic plate clamped sealed on top of the otherwise rigid channel, it will deform and you have some kind of cross-sectional profile. That's what I'm denoting as f of x in my equation here on the left. And that's really the, uh, uh, the contribution from our research group, starting with some early work, uh, uh, actually. So, so the, the, in the introduction, people, uh, it was mentioned that I did a postdoc at Princeton University with Howard Stone, and that's where some of this work started off. Uh, and then we've continued this at Purdue in my research group. Uh, and, and develop quite a lot of this theory. Now, I'm not going to go into the mathematical details. They're challenging, but, but what, I want to, what, what, I, what I will point out to you is that 
we can actually build up a predictive rigorous theory. There's nothing to fit, nothing to calibrate. We can determine everything about this function f of f using the basic equations of fluid mechanics and the basic equations of solid mechanics. The reason we feel this is an important contribution is because the earlier work, so that the, 20, the 2006 uh, experiment that I showed you, they also tried to analyze this, characterize this deformation for the three-dimensional microchannel. Uh, but they did that by trying to make an analogy to the easier cases of axis symmetry or two dimensions. So they said, okay, the average, cross-sectionally average deformation, UX, must be related to the local pressure, surely, uh, but we don't know how. So we introduced a fitting parameter to try to understand that. And it turns out, unfortunately, that this fitting parameter is not a universal number. It depends on everything in the problem. It can depend on the thickness, T of the wall. It can depend on H naught, the undeformed the height. It can depend on the width. It is kind of a mess. And so our contribution was to clean this up with mathematics. And so very briefly, uh, the basic idea is we make the problem dimensionless, capital letters. We have a we use lubrication theory to obtain the velocity profile, which turns out to be primarily uh, in the z flow s direction, but it's a three dimensional velocity profile. It can depend on x, y, the cross sectional coordinates, and z. Then we use linear elasticity after we do some simplifications via lubrication theory to relate the local deformation, ui, whatever that might be, to the local pressure p. Because if you look at this equation, this is our basic hydraulic law for which, from which we solve for the pressure variations, the pressure gradient in the microchannel. So here's one example. So if we calculate the deformation based on plate theory, we obtain the boxed equation in the middle, and it's a nonlinear equation in the pressure, right? So if, if you neglect all the terms in the brackets and just say P of Z is 12 times one minus Z, this is the regular pressure variation in a long and, sh and shallow and wide microchannel. The extra terms in the brackets comes from the fluid structure interaction, from the flow-induced deformation. And you can see those terms have a significant effect in the picture on the bottom right. The solid line is the rigid channel pressure distribution, pressure is high at the inlet, pressure is zero at the outlet because of imposed the gauge pressure. As I increase the parameter beta, which is, the, which is this dimensionless number that shows up in front of the deformation, the pressure at the inlet drops significantly. Right? The deformation increases the cross-sectional area and you can get more stuff. You can get the same amount of stuff through the channel at a fixed flow rate for a lower pressure drop. And what we contributed was actually an analysis of this problem. So, so there's some constants, S1, S2, and S3. Those are numerical constants. We can calculate them based on our elasticity problem. And there's a parameter beta that I just mentioned that's very important. It actually quantifies everything that's going on in the fluid structure interaction. So this parameter ends up being a typical pressure scale, whether it's set by the pressure drop or by the flow rate, divided by the typical elasticity modulus of the wall. Here I use the Young's modulus. And there's a function of the geometry. So beta also depends on the thickness of the wall, on the width of the channel, on the height of the channel, and things like that. And we can determine it. We can determine it from many different kinds of channels. So this is our contribution theoretically. Now, of course, we should make sure that this contribution explains or rationalizes some experimental results. Uh, that's the whole point of doing theory is to rationalize an experiment, and it does. So, so I'm showing you here in symbols, in, in the circles, the experiments from the Boston University Group 2013. Uh, the Xs are some simulations that I did, my student, that Mei Shidori did in, in uh, using two-way coupled fluid structure interaction. And the red line is uh, uh, the theory that we've developed. And at the bottom here of the slide, I've given you the, the expression is full glory. That's the theoretical expression in dimensional variables. So now you see there's the width, there's the height, there's the bending rigidity, there's the numerical constants. It's kind of messy, but it's a precise mathematical formula. And it, it agrees beautifully with the experiments and the simulations. The dashed line is Poise's law. You can see it, the rigid channel expression is not a good approximation for compliant channels. So, that, so that, that's one thing I want you to take away, if you can, is that we can actually predict this uh, uh, nonlinear flow pressure relationships for compliant microchannels using fundamental theory. I'll, I'll highlight one more result uh, that's more recent. So it matters a lot, as I said at the very beginning, how you solve the elasticity problem. Is, the, is it the thin structure? Is it the thick structure? If you remember from your elasticity courses, it makes a huge difference uh, uh, what kind of structure it is. And so we actually analyzed two different regimes in, in my group, that the thin structure regime, which was more like this example, and also a thick structure regime, which you see in the cartoon on the left here, right? So very, the green stuff is actually the, the elastic wall and the blue stuff is the flow in the micro channel. So in this case, we can build up a theory again, it's very similar to the previous one, the expressions change, and we can also validate it against a different set of experiments. 
So the bold line here is our theory. The dashed line is our theory as well, different sets of experiments, uh, with the shaded region being some experimental uncertainty. And so we're very happy that we can actually explain a range of different elasticity conditions using our both thin structure and thick structure theories. So this work was uh, by my student Xia Jia Wang, and it was published uh, last year in the Royal Society. Okay, I don't want to say anything more, anything more about the deformable channels, except I want to show you a cool video. So we've also analyzed the uh, unsteady problems. There's now transient soft hydraulics. And we put together a one-dimensional model, which involves bending, stretching, and fluid inertia. So what you're seeing here in blue is a typical axial variation. So sorry, sorry to change X and Z on you, but this X is here the axial direction, the flow is going left to right. It's a one-dimensional problem. And we're looking at the inflation of the microchannel wall and in time. As you can see, there's some very complex transients. Like I'm gonna keep playing it for you. So you can see, right, there's like a little dimple, a little dip at the beginning of the channel, then it gets straightened out, the channel shakes it off. Elasticity does not like the high curvatures. Uh, and the reason we're interested in the unsteady case is this, this complex transients are, are very curious, right? If we're trying to mix something up in this microchannel, uh, this is viscosity and diffusion dominated regime, it's very hard to mix things. You need a very long length of microchannel to, to beat the diffusion length. Uh, but if your channel is, you know, waving around, dancing like this, uh, then actually it could induce lots of cross-sectional flows and mixing. And, you know, one, one tantalizing question that we're beginning to explore in my group now is, can we? Uh, can we mix fluids at this very small scales where viscosity and diffusion dominates in new ways by taking into account this complex uh, unsteady fluid structure interaction, right? Uh, there's this school is that these are inherent. These channels are soft, they're going to deform. Can we um, uh, exploit the deformation to do something new and gain something from the whole thing? So you can read more about this, the dance of the microchannel in physical review fluids paper that just came out a few months ago. Okay, so in the last part, I'd like to tell you about another project that we're working on at Low Reynolds Number, and it involves the manipulation of shapes and motion of ferrofluid droplets. Uh, we're doing a ferrofluid droplet specifically, but more generally, the thought here is that we're working on a fundamental problem regarding manipulating fluid-fluid interfaces by non-invasive methods. So one non-invasive method is an external magnetic field and a ferrofluid droplet, but this is just one example. You have uh, nine minutes, Ivan. Perfect. Thank you. So I'd like to motivate this work by, by a quote from uh, Pierre Gio de Gen in his 1994 Dirac Memorial Lecture. He, he says, the interfaces between two forms of matter are responsible for some of the most unexpected actions. This border is sometimes frozen, but in many areas, there is an overlap region, which is mobile, diffuse, and active. And this is like, you know, to me, it's a very inspiring quote, right? This interfaces are mobile, diffuse, and active. And so here's some examples. Uh, in the middle, you see a diffuse interface. This is mixing of, of miscible fingers uh, uh, of, of one fluid into another in a porous medium. On the right, you see dendrites. These are active. These are caused by precipitation reactions in a battery uh, electrode. And on the very far left is the example that I want to tell you about. That's the mobile interfaces. These are ferrofluids. And so uh, it's a little bit of a joke here. I, I call it a ferrofluid FSM flying spaghetti monster. If you're not familiar, you can read about this internet phenomenon of the flying spaghetti monster. Uh, but the idea here is you can generate this, you know, really crazy patterns by applying a magnetic field on a ferrofluid. A ferrofluid is a suspension of magnetic particles in a otherwise Newtonian fluid. So you can get this very, very crazy, uh, mysterious patterns that can form. And that's the problem I'd like to focus on, this mobile interfaces and their nonlinear dynamics. So, okay. So here, here's the, the canonical setup that, that, that I'll focus on for this, for this next few minutes. Uh, we're going to take a confined ferrofluid droplet. So we're going to confine this droplet between two plates. This is known as a, as a Healy shock configuration. And the reason we confine it is because the problem becomes two-dimensional. Two-dimensional problems are easier to understand than three-dimensional problems. We'd like to solve this first, then we'll do 3D. Okay, we've confined the droplet between these two plates, distance B. We put two Helmholtz coils, or anti-Helmholtz coils in this case, with, with uh, currents going in opposite directions above and below the Healy Shaw cell. We run a current through the middle via a wire. All that does is it creates a magnetic field which has both a radial and an azimutal component. So you see here the magnetic field visualized by these cartoons. The combined magnetic field from the uh, from the uh, axial 
and uh, sorry, the combined magnetic field axial and radial components looks like this at the bottom. So what this does is it creates a force that acts on the surface in a particular uh, uh, non non orthogonal direction, and that causes the dynamics. Our basic equations are on the right. These are the Healy Shaw equations. Viscosity of the fluid is A. The gap is B. B is the fluid pressure, and the red terms come from the magnetic field and the magnetization inside of the ferrofluid droplet. We use a linear magnetization law that's very standard in this field, and there's a kinematic boundary condition that tells us how the surface is going to move in response to the flow that the magnetic field generates inside of the droplet. And so here is what happens when you when you uh, when you do this. We take a circular droplet, that's what you see on the left, and I'm going to impose this combined magnetic field on it. And the, you know, a video is worth a thousand pictures, a picture is worth a thousand words. So there's something like 10 to the sixth amount of information here. Hopefully you can keep up. Uh, so this is what's happening very quickly. So in the red, you see the initial circular interface. It is slightly perturbed. So on the left, you see it in two-dimensional space. On the right, you see it sort of, you, you cut the, the droplet open and you un, unwind the interface. So initially I'm, I'm perturbing it a little bit. It's slightly wavy. You can, you, can, you can barely see it on the left. And I wanna see what happens to that perturbation. That perturbation grows immediately and you get the spiky droplet. It's no longer circular and it spins. Wow, very interesting, right? So what happened? So it turns out this the interface, linear, the circular interface is linearly unstable. So if I add a slight waviness to it, initially some experimental imperfection, it's not going to go back to the circular shape. It cannot, the magnetic field uh, pushes the droplet to evolve in time. But this evolution, interestingly enough, it's not, it's not completely unbounded. I don't get this thing to form this crazy fingers that grow without bound and it becomes some sort of distorted crazy pattern. It grows very orderly and it becomes the spiky pattern. So the reason for that is that it's linearly unstable, but it's weakly non-linearly stable. So the non-linearities non non in the system eventually arrest the instability, leading to a well-defined shape with a well-defined rotation and velocity. So the droplet becomes a spinning gear. And we'd like to understand why this happens, and we'd like to really uh, predictively analyze the problem. So we want to say, you know, why does it happen and how does it happen? How can you get a specific speed or a specific symmetry of the droplet, if you will? So this is work by, uh, by me and my student, Zhang Zhengyu, which you can read about on the archive. It just got posted last night. So this is, you know, hot off the press uh, research here. So I have a few minutes, so maybe I'll give you some of the technical details, but, but I don't want to go through all of them. We can discuss them later. So, so, so we mentioned this, right, that there's a linear instability that's arrested by nonlinearity. So what's often commonly done in this, in this Healy Shaw business is we do a weekly nonlinear expansion in terms of Fourier modes. So Xi here is the kth Fourier mode of this interface. So I can decompose any interface into a bunch of Fourier modes. And each Fourier mode grows in time, the dot is a time derivative according to its linear term with some growth rate and a bunch of coupling terms, which we've only expanded to second order. So the linear term tells us about what's going to happen to the perturbation. It's going to be influenced by both surface tension, by the azimuthal, by the normal, and by the combined magnetic field. So the magnetic field shows up in three different ways in the, uh, in the linear growth rate of the perturbations. And the last term is very interesting because it has an I. Right? So if you do a linear stability analysis for hilly shaw problems, you're mostly used to these other terms, surface tension, the one minus k squared, maybe some other terms. Uh, they're mostly real. This one is actually imaginary. So this, this brings about this, the idea that maybe this droplet will rotate, right? If I have an I that shows up over here, I get a, a, a complex exponential when I integrate the linear term and it might start spinning. And this tells us what exactly is going to, which parameters are going to modify the spin. Uh, MBA and MBR are just magnetic bond numbers. There's two different magnetic bond numbers because my magnetic field can have a certain strength in the radial direction and in the azimuthal direction. So there's two magnetic bond numbers that govern the problem. And so on the left, you see uh, the evolution. So, so here is the, the sort of the, the, mag the magnitude of the kth mode. It's a complex Fourier mode. So it has a, it has a X, K, Xi k and Xi minus k. Its magnitude grows in time initially, right? This looks like the exponential growth at the very early times. And then it levels off. So the, amplitude, the, the modes, the Fourier modes saturate. They saturate because of nonlinearity. The dashed lines are from the weekly nonlinear analysis, this big equation. And the solid lines are from nonlinear uh, simulations using a vortex sheet Lagrangian method. So we see that you know the weekly nonlinear analysis is 
qualitatively right, the mold saturate, but quantitatively, there's a little bit, bit of a difference. So we do have to also do simulations in addition to theory. In the middle, you see this, this, this uh, space-time diagram of the unwound interface. So initially it's flat with a very small perturbation, and as time goes on, it forms these waves and they start propagating. And on the right, you see the, the droplet shape. So we can generate the droplet motion by nonlinear interfacial waves. So on the left, you see this interfacial waves. They're, they're very nonlinear. They maybe look like a Stokes wave if you do water waves with this sort of sharp, sharp crests, and they propagate. As they propagate around the droplet, they cause it to spin. The wind up as soon as you can. Okay, so that's the last part. So, so, so we can do this predictably, and we can build up a phase diagram on the bottom left, which tells us exactly which initial perturbations will evolve into which shapes. So here in the middle is my shape from the top, from the middle right, and I can start with all kinds of different shapes. Some of them are stable in the white region, some of them are unstable in the gray region, and we can do this in a predictive way. So that's all I have for you. Uh, of course, this work is not just by myself, but my group. So I've highlighted the work on microchannels by uh, Tan Mei, and Vishal has worked on that, and Xiao Jia has worked on that. And Zhang Zhen here on the, on the right works on the uh, 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 spinning droplets. So thank you for your attention. And then this is where I'll conclude. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Devesh, is Jesse ready, you think? Yes. Jesse, you can take the ball. Yeah, let's right. um, uh, let's push the questions off to the end. Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I apologize. I'm, uh, you know, like many of us, quarantined with uh, children. In my case, between the ages of four and fourteen, uh, who are doing remote school. So it, it's a bit, uh, a bit crazy. And if you hear any noises, I apologize. You know, as I mentioned, I have three kids. I also have seven chickens uh, and two cats. So. Who knows? This can be an exciting meeting. Let me uh, share my screen here. Uh, and if you know, it's, it's always weird giving a talk in front of a screen. So if you just all of a sudden can't hear me, um, or if anything happens, will someone send me an email so I'm not talking forever into a black hole? Uh, all right. Can can everyone see my screen here? Yeah, great. Yes, Jesse, go ahead. All right, fantastic. So, I'm going to be speaking about um, slightly higher Reynolds numbers than in, in Ivan's talk. So, so my, our background, my my research group, were focused on uh, turbulent flows, and the the focus here is going to be on uh, modeling turbulent particle laden flows. And I want to use two contemporary examples uh, as motivation to really highlight the challenges. Uh, and, and the interesting flow physics. And so we'll be talking about COVID-19 and, and uh, Mars 2020. So to begin, I'd like to acknowledge um, my research group, my students, my postdocs, uh, who I've been working with many of them since I joined the University of Michigan in um, uh, 20, uh, 2016. Uh, I'd like to point out that, uh, I guess, a, a quick, um, Quick thing to note, uh, my my two postdocs here, Aaron and Mehdi, they're going to be on the job market soon. And uh, Ali, Greg, Yuan, and Sarah are all defending uh, in the spring and summer. So as you can see, my group's going to get very small soon. Calvin here is an undergrad, uh, and so I'll be recruiting. And if anyone's looking for uh, really talented postdocs or, or uh, faculty uh, in, in CFD, please let me know. So just wanted to uh, put that plug out there. So our research group is focused on uh, CFD. Uh, big emphasis is on multi-phase flows, uh, fluidization, turbulence, all under the umbrella of, of high-performance computing. And uh, you know, turbulent particle-laden flows can be found in lots of different areas in uh, environmental flows, in engineering applications. A couple examples I'd like to highlight uh, what our group's been looking at over the last couple of years. So fluidized bed reactors has been a really driving uh, um, application. Uh, both for technologies related to post combustion carbon capture and also renewables such as uh, uh, biomass pyrolysis. We also have done work with uh, brake dust emissions. Uh, what are sound suppression? So, using uh, uh, a liquid phase droplets to suppress acoustics. Uh, I have a, a, a grant with ONR looking at dust ingestion, charged particles in atmospheric uh, clouds, and, and looking at cohesive particles uh, breakup of or deagglomeration of, of uh, uh, powders. 
And so, you know, these are very rich flows. There's a lot of physics going on. Uh, you have interactions with turbulence, with, with particles, so droplets, solid particles, and, and bubbles. And uh, that's, that's really a big emphasis of our group. So in this talk, I'd like to use uh, COVID-19 and uh, uh, plume surface. So the spread of infectious aerosols related to COVID-19 and plume surface interactions, which is related to the recent uh, NASA mission Mars 2020, as two motivating examples. And uh, so the, the way this talk will go in the next, I guess, 20 minutes or so, uh, I, I want to introduce these problems, talk about the fluid dynamics challenges. It's going to be a very high level talk. I, I, you know, there's 100 something people here. I'm assuming not everyone's a fluid dynamicist, uh, but I'm happy to go deeper into any of this. Uh, after introducing these problems, I'll talk about uh, some of the modeling challenges, and then I want to to show a recent modeling framework we've been developing in our group. So all all the the results and all everything I'm presenting here is stuff we've been looking at basically over the pandemic. So, so I, I want to show very recent uh, uh, results from our group. So just to begin, um, obviously COVID-19, this is an important problem. The virus itself has you know, lived inside bats for 65 million years and is now only uh, um, in, now is now only being interacting with with humans. So there's a lot about the biology that still remains to be understood, uh, such as like the, the, uh, the critical threshold for, for infection. But it is now well established that the spread of COVID-19 is uh, predominantly through airborne transmission. And so when you speak or cough, you expel droplets of varying size. Large droplets tend to fall fairly fast. Small droplets uh, get suspended. And the virus itself, here's my, my picture of COVID virus, is on the order of 100 nanometers. And so droplets as small as one micron can actually hold um, quite a few of these of, of the virus load. And so um, when, when it comes down to looking at uh, transmission and looking at disease outbreaks, it's really the fluid dynamics that's controlling where those droplets go. So the, I'm saying here, you know, the transmission of COVID-19 is largely due to how these droplets and aerosols are being transported. So it's a fluid dynamics problem. And probably not too surprising, the majority of these outbreaks have taken place in indoor spaces with poor ventilation. So heating, ventilation, air conditioning uh, moves these droplets around if you're not bringing in fresh air to dilute uh, the concentration of the infectious aerosols, then uh, everyone in that room gets exposed. So that's that's the first motivation. Uh, I'd like to point out a couple things. Um, it, back in, in April, there was a, uh, this, this paper, The Flow Physics of COVID-19, was published by Mattel and others at Johns Hopkins. Uh, it was on archive. It's now published in JFM. And in the conclusion, they make this claim, you know, they're hoping for this to be a call to arms for, uh, for fluid dynamicists and really provide a starting point for researchers who are motiv uh, motivated to tackle the science of COVID-19 and other diseases. Uh, because this is very much a fluid dynamics problem, let's, let's use our skill set to, to address it. And since this paper came out, there's been a number of, of publications, and I just want to quickly highlight some of the, uh, what I think are the particularly good papers that have been published since the pandemic started related to uh, multi-phase flows and fluid dynamics. So a couple of days, about a week after this paper, Detlef uh, Losey published the distance rule in times of corona. That's on archive. That's a, that's a good paper about the uh, fluid dynamics and, and the six foot rule. Uh, there was a nice physics of fluids paper on the effectiveness of, of masks. Uh, Howard, Stern, Howard Stone's group published a paper looking at uh, droplets that are expelled during uh, speaking, which is uh, quite interesting. And uh, Balish and Dar uh, and Stephen Zaleski and others, if you look at the, the authors on this paper, it's really a powerhouse of, of multi-phase flow uh, uh, scientists. This is a really nice paper that came out recently that was, it was on archive, just showed up in IGMF, focusing on the multi-phase flow aspects of uh, social distancing and, and you know, aerosol transmission. So anyone interested in fluid dynamics or multi-phase flow and its application to COVID, I, I really recommend looking at those papers. So that's COVID. Uh, now let's talk about something completely different, the Mars 2020 rover. So uh, a lot of my research has been funded by NASA, specifically looking at uh, one key challenge with space exploration. So if we, if we look at Mars 2020, the Perseverance uh, um, rover, 
It's designed to search for signs of ancient microbial life. It was launched back in July. Uh, perhaps you, you watched the launch and it's planned to land in uh, February on February 18th. And it turns out that uh, plume surface interactions, when a spacecraft approaches the surface of a, of a planet or a, uh, or a moon, the high speed uh, plume that's generated from the, ex the, exo the exhaust plume from the rocket engines can kick up lots of the regolith or the surface material. And that can generate craters that form and lead to ejecta that head towards the spacecraft. And I think during some of the uh, Apollo missions, they recorded ejecta traveling at near orbital speeds. So it's, it's a really big deal. Uh, previous missions have shown that uh, the dust environment can spoof the landing radar, so that's not good. And uh, there's actually, for the, the Curiosity rover, the wind sensor was damaged during landing. This is a great photo of, uh, of InSight that landed on Mars, and you can see three clear craters that were formed. And so this is, represents one of the key challenges of, of space exploration. And as we move towards larger payloads, so if we want to go to uh, human uh, uh, um, crewed missions to, to Mars, then there's going to be larger payloads, larger mass flow rates, and these problems are going to just get exasperated. It turns out, though, experiments are very difficult because you don't only have low gravity, you also have low atmosphere. And so we're, NASA's very, really very much relying on numerical simulations in order to, uh, um, to, to design for these missions. And um, maybe surprisingly to some uh, previous missions, including the Mars 2020 mission, the landing environment was informed based on Apollo era analysis from the 1960s. So we really need a uh, you know 21st century solution to looking at this interaction between high speed uh, uh, turbulent plumes and and uh, uh, particulate matter. And so this requires an understanding of the physics of high-speed fluidization. So these are two very different examples, COVID-19 plume surface interactions, but I'm hoping to show uh, or convince some of you in the next couple of minutes that they share very similar flow physics and the modeling challenges uh, in one case might be more extreme, but, but they're similar. Okay, so if we were interested in modeling or simulating uh, particles in fluids, it turns out, you know, we actually know the governing equations. So the fluid is, is governed by the Navier-Stokes equations, essentially mass is conserved, momentum is conserved, and then you need appropriate boundary conditions at the, uh, the surface of each particle. And then each particle can be tracked using Newton's second law. So this is essentially a statement of force is equal to mass times acceleration. Here are the forces on each particle. We have uh, the fluid stresses tau, so pressure and viscous stresses integrated at the surface of each particle, and then collisions between particles. Obviously, there can be other forces as well, but I'm just focusing on these two here. And the, the collisions can be uh, described using contact mechanics. Note I have this asterisk here. So if, when you're dealing with, say, phase change, melting, devolutization, the governing equations get are trickier. But for rigid particles in a flow, if it's turbulent, if it's laminar, uh, they're described by these equations. So that's convenient. Unfortunately, this requires uh, sub-particle scale resolution, right? This requires knowledge of that stress, the pressure, the viscous stress, um, at the surface of, of each particle. And for most applications, especially for things like uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, so aerosol transmission, or for landing sites related to plume surface interactions, there's no way we can track each individual particle and down to the resolution, subparticle resolution. So this requires, um, in order to develop tractable methods, we have to do some type of averaging or filtering. Uh, which inevitably results in unclosed terms that need to be modeled. And uh, one, you know, one way to, to look at this is you could take that the stress tensor tau, so again, pressure, viscous stress, and you can split that up into some, uh, the, the resolved pressure, so the pressure and viscous stress that you capture on your, on your computational grid, which is at a scale larger than the particle, and then you have a residual contribution that you can't resolve. And using um, an app by just applying divergence theorem, you have now the mass times acceleration of the particle. You have the uh, they feel the each particle feels the resolved pressure and viscous stress, 
and then this quantity here that requires modeling. And this is exactly what we call drag. This, the uh, pressure and viscous stresses at the subparticle scale that we don't resolve is exactly where uh, drag models come in. And traditionally, the way we do this is we consider a particle. Um, there's some in inflow velocity U. And then we write a, uh, the corresponding force based on known quantities. So here, MP is the, the mass of the particle, tau P is the response time. It's a function of the diameter and the viscosity of the fluid. We know the, the velocity of the particle and we know something about, about U. And so uh, George uh, Stokes in the 1800s derived this formula for, for drag, assuming axisymmetric, um, very small Reynolds number uh, using uh, stream functions. But then you can ask, what about real flows, right? In a realistic system, a particle can, what if the flow is non-uniform? Or what if the flow is unsteady? Or what if the, the particle is accelerating or de-accelerating? De uh, a drag force like this is not going to be sufficient. And so uh, here, what I'm writing is, are the, the BBO equations, which is commonly, uh, you know, look at any multi-phase flow textbook. This is, you know, introduction to uh, 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 particle inflows. The, uh, basset busnex scene equation. What we have here is the, uh, the forces acting on each particle. We have the resolved stresses. We have the quasi strict quasi Just so you have like 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. quasi steady drag, and so that's what we're discussing here. Added mass, so if the particle is accelerating, it'll accelerate the fluid with it, and so it feels a, a virtual mass. Uh, a basset history term, due to uh, which accounts for the uh, um, delay in a boundary layer development. And so each of these terms needs to be uh, modeled. And if we look at the application of, say, COVID-19 or, or plume surface interactions, these models are either non-existent or just not valid in most cases. And so we've probably all seen similar situations uh, or simulations like this in the news. You have aerosols being expelled and uh, different people interacting with them. And if we look what's going on, um, you know, particles respond to the smallest scales of the turbulence. And so one question is, how do we uh, resolve this? And so if we look at the Stokes drag, tau P for, say, a three micron particle is about 10 microseconds. But typically, we care about much longer time scales. And so we can't resolve down to that time scale. And similarly, the velocity scale, we can't resolve the, uh, the, the smallest scales of turbulence. And so we typically have to split that up into a mean and fluctuating uh, a component. And if we look at the case for, for um, plume surface interactions, now we have issues with uh, high Mach numbers, supersonic speeds, and they're just either the models don't exist or they're not appropriate. And uh, real quick, I just want to show, you know, there, there does exist, if you look at, say, Cliff's textbook, drag laws as a function of Mach number. Um, but the one issue is that these drag laws don't account for neighboring effects. And if you read the fine print, uh, so my student, Greg Shalcross, you know, came to me one day and said, you know, he's reading this paper and they casually mentioned that many of these drag correlations were actually combined with experimental data using cannon fire from the 18th century. So clearly there's room for improvement uh, when it comes to, to using these models. Now I want to get into um, what, what happens when you have collections of particles and then present this a new framework we've been developing. So here, if, if it's now well established, if you do simulations, it flows past, past particle collections of particles, that you can compute the drag over each particle, and most drag laws account for that mean. Uh, however, existing drag laws really fail to capture the variant particle velocity variance and, and, or the dispersion. And what you, what you could ask is why? So if you have a, a computational cell with multiple particles, you know, usually it's written in terms of volume fraction and Reynolds number. In, each, in these three cases, each cell has the same volume fraction Reynolds number, but this green particle will obviously have different drag. And uh, there's a work done by Anthony Wax, Wax's group from uh, uh, University of British Columbia showing that the drag correlations that exist do a pretty good job at computing the mean, but there's significant spread uh, about that mean. And so what I want to point out is that if we go back to the equation, there's many other, so there's many places where modeling needs to be improved. And I just want to focus in this talk because I only have 20 minutes on, on drag. But again, all of those effects of added mass, if it's unsteady, Mach number contributions, accelerating flows, 
or neighbor effects are all lumped into this tau prime, this, this residual stress on each particle. And so what we're looking at is instead of teasing out each individual contribution to the forces and attempting to model them separately, we want to develop a stochastic drag model that incorporates these effects uh, into particle statistics. And so what we're doing here is we're treating this, this, this um, residual force that, that where all of the physics lives as a mean drag and then a fluctuating drag. Uh, the mean drag turns out we have drag laws that work quite well as a function of Reynolds number and volume fraction. So that's good that, that, that we don't have to do any additional modeling. Um, and the, the way that we're approaching this F prime is to solve this using a force Langevin equation. And so my postdoc, uh, Aaron, just uh, uh, wrote a, a paper in JFM that should be showing up online uh, very soon. And he shows very nice analytic work of that you can ensure to, you could get the right velocity variance and dispersion uh, uh, using such, such a form. So this is a stochastic equation, but we see that there's two unclosed terms. There's this tau F which is the, the time scale associated with a fluctuating force, a, a hydrodynamic force of drag. And then we have this sigma, which is the variance of the, uh, of the drag. And then this W here is a Gaussian white noise. And uh, it turns out that that time scale is actually really well, uh, um, it, it, we can model that using the time between successive collisions. And we already have a model for that uh, uh, based on kinetic theory, which is a function of the volume fraction the radial distribution function and the granular temperature, which is the particle velocity variance. All of this is knowledge we know from the simulations. And so this actually works quite well. And so we can we have a model closure for that time scale. But the question is, how do we deal with this uh, uh, the standard deviation in drag? So this the, the variance in drag, we need a model for that. So we've been working closely with uh, Professor Shankar Subramaniam from Iowa State. He has a large database of these simulations particle resolve simulations at different volume fractions, density ratios. And it turns out that if you look at the PDF of the drag force, it tends to be Gaussian. And um, what we find is that the mean drag is modeled very well with a, uh, if we normalize it by a, uh, a force on an isolated particle and then add a, uh, a volume fraction correction. And similarly, the standard deviation in drag also collapses very well. This is showing as a function of volume fraction and different Reynolds numbers, we get this really nice collapse in the standard deviation if we normalize it by the force on an isolated particle. And so in this case, that's the Schiller-Neumann drag correlation. And so we have this, uh, we could fit a line through this. And now we have a model for uh, each term that shows up in that stochastic equation. So one thing we can ask is how well does it work? Three this minutes. This is a homogeneous. Three minutes. Three minutes. Oh, t okay. Um, well, I'm almost done. So, um, okay. What I'm showing here is is a non-dimensional granular temperature or velocity variance, and this is a cooling case. So the particles have initial agitation. It's in a viscous flow, and then we let we just let it go. And the black symbols are showing the DNS results. And then the symbol in blue is if we just solved an Euler-Lagrange method. So we, we track each particle, we use a drag law, but we don't account for the, the, we just use a mean drag. We don't account for the variance or the stochastic fluctuations. And you could see, and then the red is using the model that I just proposed. And as it cools, there's interactions between turbulence and the particles, uh, and eventually it gets to the steady state. And we see very good agreement between the DNS and the uh, this this uh, this model that we just mentioned. Both that uh, we're looking at two different Reynolds numbers. Down here, we're looking at a similar case, but uh, we start. This is a homogeneous heating case. So the particles initially have no no agitation. We put it in a flow that that um, a mean flow, and then there's turbulence that's generated that induces fluctuations in the particles. And again, we see very good behavior, uh, uh, comparison between the model. If we don't account for that fluctuating force, it takes much longer to reach that level of granular temperature. Um, in the last minute or so, I just want to mention that we're not the first ones to show that the the PDF of drag, the distribution of drag over a collection of particles is Gaussian. So uh, Balashandar and his group showed uh, that you have flow past resolved particles. They also observed Gaussian behavior in drag. Uh, Huang in 2017 showed this. And so there are uh, several papers in the last five years. Uh, and I was presenting this to some colleagues uh, at NASA and they asked, well, why? Why is the drag Gaussian? 
And actually, um, I realized I, I never asked that question and, and I didn't really know. And like every good scholar, what I did was I went on Twitter and while I was on Twitter, uh, there was this this post. What's something that you technically understand, but still seems a bit like magic? And this person here responded, the central limit theorem. And I started thinking, OK, the central limit theorem just says that when you have independent random variables and you add them together, the sum will tend towards a normal distribution. And I think this is an interesting, I think the central limit theorem is useful here because one, it could show that, um, you know, this this potentially is why the distribution of drag on a collection of particles is Gaussian, but also it could tell us the limits where it should break down, right? So our, our Langevin equation assumes Gaussian and that means the model should work well. But if the drag is not independent, which is likely at lower Reynolds numbers, you're gonna have viscous scales are much longer this this is telling us that those models might break down and so we're now looking into exploring the applicability of the central limit theorem for these collections um okay so the final maybe 30 seconds or one minute uh, we have this model we need to close it and so now we're starting to do these very high resolution simulations of coughing uh realistic cough actually has multiple pulses within one second and we think that that's going to lead to vortex vortex interactions that can affect the dispersion of aerosols so this is a very large simulation we're resolving the turbulence but we can now use this data to inform closure for these models uh and then the, the other question is well how do we do this when we have uh for, for the case with plume surface interactions with nasa we now need to develop new numerical methods so we can look at higher Mach number flows. And so my student, Greg, has been developing a new immersed boundary method. He's spending a lot of time validating it so we can look at these higher Mach number cases, its effect on drag. And so I'll just uh, finish this, this talk saying that this is a simulation of uh, that the NASA is currently performing. It's a full landing site, 50 meters by 20 meters. This black is showing the resolution. So you can see near the surface where all the particles are is very fine resolution. If we zoom in, their grid spacing near the particles is about 0.01 meters, which is about the size of the simulations we're currently running. So we're running these particle resolve simulations at a resolution grid spacing of about one micron that allows us to isolate the effect of turbulence and compressibility on things like drag. Um, this is just a snapshot showing you these, these flows are very complicated. You have turbulence, you have these uh, shocklets that form uh, and, uh, you know, th and these conditions we're running at Reynolds numbers of the particles of 300 Mach numbers ranging from 0.1 to 1 are actually very applicable to what we might see during a plume surface interaction on Mars. And so we're now developing these methods, running these simulations in order to develop these new drag laws. Again, um, the approach we're taking is instead of teasing out each individual contribution separately, we want to model them stochastically. And so just to conclude, um, I'd like to say that, you know, turbulent dispersed G-phase flows uh, have rich physics. They're important and, and have consequences in several aspects of human life. A direct solution to these equations is not tractable. We have to rely on modeling and the modeling framework should be grounded in first principles. And then the uh, and and the models should be informed by methods that are accurate and for the relevant flow physics. And so we're using these new methods uh, that are being developed in order to develop uh, improved models, both for, uh, related to exploratory events for COVID-19 and also for these more extreme conditions where you have high Mach number flows. Uh, and and with that, I will uh, I will conclude. I apologize. If I thank, thank you, Jesse. Yeah, um, Devesh. Yes, uh, I just want to thank both speakers for uh, very nice talks and then pass it on to you. If you have questions yeah. waiting on the chat, maybe you could bring some of them up. Thank you, Srini. Yes, there are a few questions. Uh, thank you, Jesse and Ivan. So I see Ivan is already trying to answer some of them. So one of the questions, Ivan, we have right now is for if you start with the unseeded droplet, what factor influence the wavelength of the spiky perturbation that emerges when you turn on the magnetic field? Yeah, that's a great question. So I put a little answer, short answer in the chat people can read, but for everybody else who's listening, the idea is that there is a most unstable wave number. So this was KM on one of my slides. We didn't go into those details, but we can actually calculate the dominant wave number. And that's actually what sets the spiky symmetry. 
So the idea is there's many unstable perturbations, uh, but there's one that is the most unstable, and that's the one you expect to grow fastest and therefore set the symmetry of the shape. So, so we see it in a particular way, but in practice, you can sort of random perturbations will eventually cause the most unstable wave number to grow. And we can calculate it. Like there's a formula for it based on everything else. And I think the follow on question to that was what determines the number of spikes in this spinning droplet? Yeah. And so those are related. So it's, it's the same, it's the same idea. It's the most unstable wave number which causes the pattern to assume a particular shape. Is the one that grows the fastest. And the last one was uh, did you consider temperature effect on the deformation and uh, pressure? So maybe this is more of a question about the first part of my talk about the uh, the PDMS microchannels. Yeah. Uh, we, we did not, but I think that's a fantastic question because uh, as we do know, gels can swell. Uh, they can either uptake either some fluid from the channel or they can change their shape due to, due to heating. Uh, and the problem becomes, from my point of view as a fundamental mechanics problem becomes fascinating because then you have like thermal mechanics involved, not just elasticity and flow, you also have thermal stresses and things like that. So no, we haven't considered it, but but I would love to come up with some really interesting questions in which in which the, the thermal stresses matter. Thank you, Ivan. So Jesse, there are a few questions for you also. Uh, one of them is uh, what software was used to model particle flows? Sure. So we have uh, two in-house research codes we've been developing uh, for basically one for low Mach number, one for high Mach number. And um, the low Mach number code is NGA, which uh, some of you might be familiar with. It was developed by my advisor at uh, um, when he was at Stanford, Olivier Desjardins, that we've been uh, um, um, basically developing quite a bit since since starting at uh, Michigan. So that so the, the simulation I showed of the uh, comparison with the DNS and the droplets was all in NGA. And then uh, all this, the immerse boundary method we're developing for high speed flows is uh, being developed in our uh, a different code that we're developing. And so that's high order finite difference, um, purely explicit. So it's, it's very fast and paralyzable, but allows us to deal with complex geometries. You have a question, another question, which is about in case of a sneeze or cuff, the volume fraction is so low that droplet droplet interaction is virtually non existent. Yeah. Yeah, this is a great point. So, uh, the, um, the modeling I was showing and the, the closure I was showing was indeed for these higher volume fraction cases, which is not relevant for coughing and sneezing. However, when for droplet dispersion, when you have aerosols, you know, during, during coughing, uh, what you end up missing the tur the turbulence at the particles the the small scale turbulence you miss is not due to neighbor induced fluctuations it's due to unresolved turbulence because you can't resolve down to that scale so you can use a similar modeling framework uh, uh, the closure will be different so the closure I presented is not appropriate for that that's why I was showing that coughing simulation we can use that to inform uh, new closure but you're exactly right it's a different regime at the lower volume fraction. So, so, so to model this random component, basically need to do the background turbulence. Is that the interest? Yeah. So you need to be able to, uh, it, it, for the case of coughing and sneezing, the particles are responding in the smallest turbulence. So you need to perform a direct numerical simulation that resolves the uh, the particle transport in the in the turbulent flow. That's why I was showing that simulation is very expensive. It's uh, almost half a billion grid points. But then what you can do is take that data and tease out. The, uh, t the relevant time scales and the rel and the relevant uh, uh, force uh, uh, scales and uh, in that stochastic framework. Can I uh, say something, David? That idea of using uh, Langevin model for uh, yeah. uh, taking into account uh, either the entire turbulence in the context of RANS or uh, um, um, subgrid scale in terms of LES has uh, enormous literature, uh, uh, yep. software, Reynolds. Uh, so th there is enormous work that has been done in that area, especially taking into account uh, uh, inhomogeneity and so on and so forth. Uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, how this applies to um, multi-particle interaction. Thanks. So 
I, with 20 minutes, it was really hard to, to cover everything. And I originally had details on that. So when you have, uh, you know, when I, when I was mentioning earlier on that, when you do these simulations of like, you know, you look in the news and you see these droplet dispersion of people on a bike, you, you're typically using RANDs, coupling it with Lagrangian particles. And then you have a uh, Langevin type model, but it's usually modeled on the, to model the fluid velocity, not the force itself. And so this paper, my postdoc just wrote, had really connected this hierarchy of what if you treat the position stochastically or the velocity or the force, and then what can you, what can you capture and what do you miss? And we're finding that you retain the most physics when you treat the force stochastically. Um, and, and it actually works really well for accounting for these neighbor induced fluctuations, but, but I'm glad you, you, you mentioned that. We have another question about how can you adapt the drag model for curved aerosol when droplets are connected, forming, and evaporation becomes important to the problem. Yeah, so so um, we we're we're just I actually have my undergraduate students the one running those the simulations and uh, uh, what I want to do first was focus on the hydrodynamics, but but it's very well known that the temperature effects, the thermodynamics play a really big role. And so uh, what's likely what's going to happen is there's not only subgrid scale uh, uh, turbulence that's important, there's going to be like uh, subgrid scale heat transfer that's also in phase change that's important as well. And so we think that uh, we haven't, you know, this is something we've only been looking at pretty recently, but when you start including the thermodynamics, I think we can also model some of the th thermal effects uh, stochastically as well, which will lead to additional unclosed terms. But if you can do a DNS that resolves it uh, with with trusted models, then hopefully you can upscale that with with such a framework. That that's the that, at least that's the way I'm thinking about it. So there was another question on the evaporation itself. So the droplets yep. will evaporate or merge during transport. How it is considered, or does it matter? And let me just add this other question. You can think about this. We know virus are hundred nanometer, and airborne aerosol is microns. Then the yep. particles should just follow the flows as subgrid scaling modeling of particles should be essentially the SGL modeling of the particle. So if you want to address both together, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. So so um, there's a there's a wide distribution when so the aerosols range are going to range the, the relevant aerosols and droplets that are carrying the virus is going to range from about one micron, because below that it's not carrying much of the virus, to uh, on the millimeter scale. And if you are, you know, there's two main effects when it comes to transmission. One is a uh, transient in the sense when you cough or sneeze, if you're near someone, you're going to be exposed if you're in that line of sight. But then there's also the steady state, the, the bigger droplets will fall and the smaller droplets will remain suspended for a long period of time. And so if you care about the larger particles, then you can't just treat it as a scalar because they're going to have their own inertia. There's going to be preferential concentration, which Lagrangian particles with RANs cannot capture preferential concentration. It's very difficult and it's, it's an active research area. And so if you want to get the full range of droplet uh, sizes, you can't just treat it as a scalar. And then on, on top of that, with the evaporation question, um, we're focusing on sort of the near, near field. And so likely evaporation is not taking place too important in that very near field early time, um, but we do want to uh, investigate that. Jesse, these droplets evaporate within uh, half a second to their final state. Okay, so then, yeah, so then it, 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 it is important then in the near field. Uh, what yes. I do want to mention is uh, the relative humidity plays a huge role, right? So what there's been studies showing on buses, the 50 micron droplets uh, would fall really fast on surfaces and in, confined in, in the nearest seats. But if you have low relative humidity, they can actually evaporate really fast. And then those large droplets that would normally fall are now aerosols on the order of two or three microns that stay suspended. And so that evaporation over that time scale is, is, is super important. Um, as I mentioned, our pre the first simulations we're running now are just focusing on the hydrodynamics, and then we want to add the thermodynamics. Um, but yeah, we, we definitely recognize the importance of that. <laughs> 
Yeah, in our paper, we, we I was also very surprised how fast it evaporates. So, but the but the thing is that since they become very small, most of the problem is uh, analytically treatable, and that's what we tried to do, uh, because they become very small, very fast, uh, and uh, the like you point out, the flow is the hardest part. The droplets yep. themselves just go for a ride with the flow, pretty much. Yeah, but I do want to point out that a lot a lot of there hasn't been a lot of attention on the pulsatility. So when you know when you cough, the mass flow rate, there's usually about two or three pulses. And so mm -hmm. our hypothesis is that that can actually lead to vortex vortex interactions before they evaporate. And so if the particles are still somewhat large and have inertia, maybe that has an effect on the dispersion. Maybe it's negligible, but I think it's it, it could be interesting to look at the effect of pulsatility on that initial dispersion when those particles have inertia. But then when I do agree that when they're very small, now it's a numerical methods problem because how do you resolve this? You know, your your time scale, the Stokes time scale is so much smaller than the length of the simulation you want to run. So one time step, you're going to be jumping over a, a large number of, of response times. And so uh, it, it's a different modeling challenge. So maybe in the interest of time, Jesse, I'll just ask the last question. And this was about the boundary condition representing particles coming from the exit of a person's mouth. Or are you able to simulate these? Are you able to simulate the distribution of particle sizes when they just come yep. out of the mouth? So what we did was we ran an auxiliary simulation of a turbulent pipe flow. So we had a fully developed turbulent flow, and that was our inflow condition for the fluid. And then what we did was we um, we took we we scaled it so we were able to take that turbulent inflow and then pulse it so so it represented that realistic pulsatile flow behavior and then we also seeded it with droplets with a log normal distribution that matched experimental data and so uh, we we feel it's the closest representation to a realistic cough because the turbulence is developed uh, and we have that the the realistic size distribution. Okay, so maybe you are going to close it now, Devesh. Yes, I'd like to close this, and I just want to announce for people who are still on. Uh, next week, we our team is Wearable Robotics. We have speaker from University of Michigan again, and Georgia Tech, and it's going to be moderated by Professor Marcio O'Malley from Rice University. So. We'll keep the social hour going. So if you want to stay on and uh, talk to Jesse.